Um, well, hi, so thanks, and uh, I'm real happy to be here. Uh, so my research areas, uh, as Andrea mentioned, are, are computer vision and kind of supporting areas or nearby areas like computer graphics and machine learning. Um, I, I do some high-level vision, but this talk is all about low-level things. And I have to confess, kind of thinking on my research, what really grabs me, what I really enjoy, is um, revealing something that you couldn't see otherwise uh, in some video or image. I, I really somehow get a kick out of that. And so this talk is about two pieces of work in that theme of uh, taking an image, analyzing it, and then re-rendering it in a way that we hope uh, lets you see something that you couldn't see before, or lets you see it from a different point of view, uh, that type of thing. So it's a combination vision and graphics talk. Um, so there are two pieces. Uh, one we call motion denoising, and the other we call motion magnification. And uh, of course, it was joint, both of them were joint work. Uh, motion denoising was with Michael Rubenstein, Salio Pierre-San, Fred Durand. Uh, Fred is a colleague, the others are students or graduates. Uh, motion magnification is, was with Michael Rubenstein, my student Hao Yu, Eugene Su, John Gutag, and Fred Durand. Um, Okay, so here, let's, let's look at a time lapse. Ooh, you know, one thing we could do, if we could uh, not have the lights shine on the screen, that'd be great. This is one of the things, how about ADD, yeah. Is that better? Uh, yeah. Make it all dark. No, no the heaven, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I, I don't want that. No, this is perfect, thank you. Okay, um, okay so here's the time lapse of some sprouts growing. And there are things going on at two different uh, temporal scales there. There's the kind of long-term growth of the plants, and then there's this sort of short-term uh, fluttering and flickering of the, uh, according to which way the leaves happen to be during each of the time-lapse exposures. And you might imagine that you'd want to separate those two processes out and re-render a video with each of those separately, one just only showing the long-term growth and the other showing the short-term processes. Uh, you, you, that, let's, let's say that that's our goal. Um, and so what are some ways you might do that separation? Well, if you had uh, this mythical thing of perfect motion tracking, in other words, if you could get the track of every point in those incredibly occluded sprouts accurately, then you would just um, say low pass filter those tracks and then re-render it uh, constrained by those tracks positions but I assure you that it's it's really impossible to get with all those occlusions impossible to track those feature points uh, accurately with current motion tracking technology so we want to do this separation into short and long-term processes without optical flow motion tracking uh, so instead we opted for the uh, this approach we said um, well let's take the pixels in the original video and rearrange them in space and in time to make the uh, video with the desired output properties. And uh, so here's the an, uh, energy function we introduced to, to, make the, uh, to help us make that rearrangement. So the three terms we want it to satisfy. So what we're looking for is a, is a warp function that will take, um, uh, display a certain position uh, a pixel that was grabbed from a certain spatial or and or temporal offset. So the three terms we want to have for what would make a good warp for our output video. One is we want it to look more or less like the original video. So the I is the image, uh, P is position. Uh, this is the warped video, this is the output. The output looks something like the input, that's one term. Uh, constrains it from going too far afield. Uh, secondly, we want this process video to only have the long-term components. So we want the process video to change slowly over time. So we want the process video at one time minus the process video at another time. We want that difference to be small. That's the second of our terms. And then finally, we want to have some regularization on this warp map. We don't want it to go too crazy. So we just we want to say that uh, the warp map at one position in time is not too different than the warp map at another position in time. Yes, a question. Yeah, sorry. So I'm using it willy nilly here. Um, here, this variable is time, and um, 
here I think it's time and space. So sorry for that. Uh, and here it's time. Yes, that seems rather arbitrary, doesn't it? Um, I don't remember why that distinction was made. Sorry. Yes. Um, so the, the neighborhood, uh, that determines the kind of this n of p or n t of p. That, that determines the kind of the spatial and temporal scale. Right. Right. It also determines the computational cost, as we'll see right. in a second. So Um, well, because of the computational cost, we actually haven't done the experiment of trying to make the neighborhood too large. Um, but we've done the experiment of making it too small. And uh, so there you, you uh, lose some features that, that, that flick, flicker in and out of your analysis window. And you'll see that in the next slide, actually. Uh, was there another question? Um, it, would, it, it wants to have a, impose a spatial regularization on spatial, that. Spatial, but, but no temporal. Well, um, you know, I, I, when I think I introduced it, I said space and time. I think this one actually is only space. Oh. Sorry. Um, OK, so these three terms uh, define a cost function. And you can view it uh, as a three-dimensional Markov random field to be solved, where the state that you want to solve at each node is um, where do we move to in space and in time in order to grab the pixel that we're going to put here in the output video at this position and time. And uh, we can solve such an MRF in approximate form in a number of different ways. We tried a number of approaches. Well, we tried three approaches. We tried iterated conditional modes, uh, graph cuts, and loopy belief propagation. For this particular problem, loopy belief propagation worked the best. So I'll show you, show you the results of that uh, approximate solution to this MRF. Uh, and so here, here's the output. Um, I'll run through and I'll explain what we're seeing. Um, so there are four frames. So the input's on the upper left, the output's on the upper right, and on the bottom row, it's a, this, the warp map, the story of how we got the output from the input. So um, on the left is the spatial displacement map. And spatial displacements are color coded by this color code here. The, um, the color and saturation tells you the direction and offset of, the, of, of where you jump to to grab that pixel to put here. And then this other uh, one on the bottom right shows uh, the color code for where you go forward or backward in time in order to grab the pixel that you're putting here. So the, the bottom row gives you instructions for where to reach to in order to, to construct the output pixel at this position in time. So let's see it one more time. And so uh, it, voila, it has the desired form that you, you see just only the long-term growth and you don't see the short-term uh, flittering. flittering. And, and we've done this, I should point out, without actually explicitly computing optical flow, which, is, which we don't, don't think we can do accurately enough to make this thing work. Um, let me point out the artifacts right away. Some of you may notice that these, these uh, sprouts have lost their tips in, in some of the processed output. And that was what I was just talking about, that um, uh, we, we didn't make the analysis window large enough to, to grab those things. So we can check that that's the case by, by making a small uh, video sequence and enlarging the region of support. And you can see that here's the input. Here's the processed output using a large region of support. Here's the processed output using the small region of support we used for the entire sequence. So it's a it's sort of computational cost that kept us from getting those sprout tips. But so now we have the processing that we were looking for. And we can then subtract the, pro the motion denoise from the original to get the short term and, and make the separation of the input video into its two components, the long-term components and the short-term components. I'll show that one more time. Um, and so uh, we think this is particularly useful for time-lapse imagery, but you can use it for other imagery as well. But let me just 
uh, for the rest of this first half, show you a number of examples of this type of processing on various videos. OK, sorry, uh, first, uh, let's, let's look at, uh, compare this output with a number of ways that you might uh, th come to mind to do this type of processing. Um, you, you might say, well, if I want to reduce the long-term, the short-term fluctuations, maybe I'll just sit at one position and take an average over time. And that's going to be this one. Uh, you, as you'll see, uh, it behaves the way you would expect. It. It's, it's really blurry. It's not as desired. Uh, you can take the medium over time, median over time. That's going to be a little bit less blurry, but still doesn't have the characteristics you want. And the bottom right is our denoised output. So let me show you this one again. Um, and then here, just looking at that same thing one more time, here's a uh, space-time picture. Over here. Here's space-space, here's space and time, and here's the comparison of the different processed outputs. Here's the input showing the, the, the uh, fluttering in, in the video corresponds to zigzagging in the space-time plot. Uh, here's the mean, which has this over-blurring output median. Still somewhat blurred, and then the denoise, motion denoise, uh, has the kind of desired long term streamlines that we were looking for. Uh, okay, another one, another time lapse. Um, here, there's the short term is the, the fluctuations of the plant where there's a fan on it, and then the long term, we move the light source during the time lapse, and, uh, and you can, and then the out process output just shows the long term changes without having any of the short-term distractions visible. And again, you can separate out into the long-term and short-term components of the input video. Um, let's just some other examples. Here's a time lapse of a street scene in New York City. And so now the long-term components are sort of everything that doesn't involve people. Uh, and again, you can separate out uh, short and long-term components. Um, this is nice. This is a swimming pool being dug. Um, and notice the, uh, the gas grill cover here flutters all around in the wind uh, in the original, whereas it's nicely stabilized in the output. And, and again, the, the bottom row is the, the map, which tells us how to rearrange the pixels of the input video to create the output video. And again, here's the separation into the short and long-term components of the input video. Um, ah, so uh, this is, th there's some nice uh, time lapse data from uh, something called the, sorry, something called the Extreme Ice Survey, where they um, are trying to sort of dramatize climate change by looking at time lapse imagery of glaciers. Um, and this is their input video, which really has a lot of problems as a time lapse are all sorts of fluctuations that you're not interested in that are going on and you'd rather just uh, have the long-term changes emphasized. So we asked for their permission to process the video and here's our results. The top right is the output. I'll show it one more time. Um, and again, separating out into the short and long-term components shows what we're getting rid of in the processed time lapse. So that's, uh, that's part one. You were so good about asking questions in the middle, but you can ask questions again now. Yes? Um, so you started off by saying that you didn't really want to do motion tracking, but couldn't you recover something like motion tracking and lower it up to computation to get? <sighs> Well, we've got this uh, regularizer that forces all the changes that we flag to be uh, just long-term changes. So it wouldn't be short-term. It wouldn't be the motion of the original sequence that we would compute. It would be this kind of long-term motion that we would compute. Uh, yes, Matthew. Right. Hmm. Well, let's see. No, but we're only, um, you know, it, it just doesn't handle aperture issues uh, at all properly. Uh, 
it just wants to have a smooth warp and it just wants to have the output be nicely consistent. It doesn't care anything about the regularities of the inferred motion. So I, I would assume, therefore, that it would get it wrong. <laughs> um, yes? Um, so I just had a quick question about the scale. So like, you showed videos with the lapses of sort of different magnitudes. Like yes. Like being built versus the band line. Yes. So I assume you have to play with the scale in order to get them to work, or does it all sort of work out the Well, the, um, of course, the algorithm doesn't know the absolute uh, time between frames, all it knows about are frames. Um, so, so you have to adjust like the neighborhood size, the neighborhood size? Um, yeah, I mean, you, um, the restriction on how far you're, you're willing to look for where to grab a pixel from sets a, a, a spatial scale for what, how large of motions you can uh, treat as short term and ignore. Um, yes? Is that a hand? OK. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Well, we have a uh, we have a warp regularization here. I'm, I apologize. I don't remember whether this is only space or includes time. Uh, from the way the the warp maps flash around on the display, I, it doesn't look like there's much regularity in time imposed. So I think this is just a spatial constraint. And the output. Uh, so I, I, I believe that there's only a um, spatial constraint on the warp map. That, that over time it can change as it as it pleases. But whatever it does, it must make it so that the rendered image changes slowly over time. Is this unappealing? A few more details here as to how you compute that might have been useful, but perhaps we can just zoom offline and look at the papers. Okay. I personally am still a bit puzzled by several aspects of, of, of that. So, uh, hmm. <coughs> um, so that, that's your actual regularizer. Well, I, I mean, there's, um, we've got one fidelity term, that's a top line, yeah. and then we've got two regularization terms. One says that the output video has to change slowly over time. The other says that the warp map should have not crazy spatial structure. Yes. Other questions? Yes. Uh, we're only so we we, you know, we tried a number of things, and uh, we we tried earlier versions where we allowed ourselves to modify the pixel intensity. It never worked as well as this did. Uh, we always got things that were softer than we wanted, so we treat the pixels as uh, marbles of a given color, and we can't change them, but we're allowed to rearrange them. Okay, on to part two. Uh, which is here. So this is, uh, so the, okay, the previous work was presented at CVPR last year. This work will be presented next month at SIGGRAPH. Um, and it's, uh, we call it Eulerian video magnification. So some of these slides were made by Michael, so they're, they're spiffier than I would do. Uh, we want to make a kind of a microscope on the world, a little a viewing device that lets you see things that you couldn't see otherwise. So we want to have to take this microscope and apply it to a video of a baby breathing and see that changes of the baby breathing more clearly. We want to apply it to a person's face and let you see uh, changes in color caused by blood going to the 
face during the pulse more clearly. So that's what we're going to do here. So let's talk about that last one first. Um, now it turns out, okay, we're all thankfully pumping blood to our faces. Uh, that leads to a very small change in the color of our skin between, uh, and I'm not enough of a doctor to know the words to use here, but between different phases of the cycle of the heart uh, when the blood has more oxygen with it than other times. Now, how well can we see this stuff? So let's look at the top trace. So here, here uh, three different positions on this guy's face, uh, color-coded, uh, and then as a function of frame, so this is uh, 0, 50, 100, 150 frames of 30 frames per second video, taken from my iPhone, by the way. Um, and uh, e each one corresponds to, the colors correspond to the positions on the face. So looking at these traces, it's really hard to see much going on in terms of pulse. And you, you see that it's going to be hard because look at, this is, this is the uh, quantization, the um, digit quantization level. You can see it in the, in the traces here. So we're fighting quantization noise as much as anything. But let's start out, let's take spatial averages instead of looking at single pixels. So let's take like a, uh, I, I, can't, I think I used a second, uh, second level of a Gaussian pyramid, so this is ballpark like a 10 by 10 average of pixels. And that's the bottom set of traces. Again, this is the luminous value for these three positions. And now you can start to see uh, peaks that are going on here at the uh, frequency where we would expect them to be if this corresponded to the human heart rate. And let's filter this a little bit more. Um, so here's the luminance trace from one of the, I guess from this one. And let's just do some, I, I wanted to do IIR processing on this at this time, so I just did two real, real, I don't know anything about IIR processing on top of that. So I did two real simple IIR filters um, and subtracted them to get this very simple uh, bandpass processing, these are low pass, very simple bandpass processing on the original luminance. And now the uh, changes in intensity due to the blood pulse are really quite easy to see. And you can imagine a very simple peak detector would let you know what the heart rate was. So that's good. And then on top of that, you get a little signal you can play with. And so let's say, let's, uh, well, let's take that signal in RGB and add it back into the original video and crank up the gain so we can see it. And what do we get? Well, here's what you get. Um, you know, you can see the, uh, see what, what's just really just sub-threshold for, for us by our eyes. Uh, you can see it quite clearly. So that's nice. Um, uh, well, again, this is, a, this is a process signal that we, um, the, so a mean zero process signal, so it's going to be um, both phases of, of color. And we can try it on people of different skin colors. It doesn't work quite as well uh, for this person as it does for the other one, but you can still see the effect nonetheless. Um, and let's look at, uh, you can, as, as I said, you can process the signal at the top to uh, extract the pulse. And also, you don't need to, f um, you can do that online filter. You can also, af after the fact, or after a short delay, do a more um, I ideal bandpass filter. And uh, so here, the, I don't know if you can see these. Yeah, the white dots on here, which are the detected peaks for a number of different positions on the face, and then the red vertical lines are the uh, correspond to the uh, after taking the median of those, taking to, to the peak pulse positions. And we were actually uh, collaborating with doctors who uh, study neonatals, so we have ground truth as well. Here's a picture with the ground truth. So um, this is electrocardiogram pulse, and here's. Sorry that it's a little weak here, but um, here's a signal with the pulses detected, and these two numbers should approximately agree. And, you, and we also, we're re-rendering the frame with this uh, augmented visualization added in. Um, so that's good. Uh, I should mention that we're not the first people to, to uh, show that you can f f detect blood uh, pulse from video. 
uh, Ross Picard and her group at the Media Lab did it, which actually got us started on this problem. But they did it in a way which we kind of found unsatisfying. We wanted to look at a more simple approach. They, they took their uh, RGB traces, put them into ICA, the machine learning on it, found the, the uh, independent components of this, and looked at the second eigenvector component. Uh, it's not clear why that would be the right one. And apparently used, did peak detection on this to find the pulse. Uh, we favor our more kind of direct approach of just looking at the signal itself. Uh, and then also there's, uh, there's apps you can download for your iPhone that do this as well. There's a Philips uh, Vital Sign Camera. Uh, it's proprietary, so we don't know what processing they're doing. Also for the Android phone, you can get an uh, instant heart rate uh, app that uh, shines a light and, and looks at the, you put your finger over the camera and it shines the flash at the same time, which lights up the blood in your finger and then the camera can find the pulse that way as well. Um, Okay, so that's kind of step one of having this view on the world that lets you see sub-threshold changes. Let me just show this video again. We were struck when we saw this by the uh, kind of extra motions that are going on there in the uh, color amplified uh, picture of the face. And that caused uh, us to scratch our heads and wonder why is it that it looks like he's moving more than he was. And so this leads to the second part, this motion magnification work. Um, it turns out there's a real simple explanation for why it looks like he's moving more than he was. Um, basically, uh, here's a sinusoid. Uh, and there's um, the blue one is a small change from the uh, original black sinusoid. And if you look at it as single position and you crank up that change, you might push it instead of from up to the blue line all the way up to the red line. If you do that at every position, it's really impossible to tell that apart for small displacements from pushing the line uh, horizontally and changing the position of the sinusoid. And so this uh, temporal exaggeration is uh, kind of masking itself as a, as a translation amplification. And it's easy to see uh, why this works from simple Taylor series expansion of the signal. So the top line, uh, in, suppose we have a, a, in part of the image that's rigidly translating. Okay, so i of x and t is just some envelope function f, which uh, is normally a function of x, but then there's some offset as a function of time applied to that. If that offset is small, we can take that out of the function f and approximate it as f of x, the original unmoved one, plus some temporal signal, uh, delta, the displacement times the spatial derivative at that point. Then, okay, so this is, um, uh, now this is the guy's face, and we're going to do this, this temporal, we're going to sit at one position and do our temporal bandpass filtering and then add it back in. So if we do that, here B of T is our bandpass filtered version of this, uh, and if we crank it up by some factor of alpha minus one, the minus one is just to make the algebra work out nice on the next line, but crank it up by some fairly big factor and add it back in, this is our process signal. But then if we realize that the bandpass filtered version is just this temporal offset times the local slope, this next line is what we're actually computing. So it's the original unmoved signal plus some amplification factor times the uh, translation temporal signal times the local slope. And then if you then for a second time use that Taylor series approximation, if this is a small enough amplification, you can realize that that's just um, the original signal translated by some bigger amount than it was translated the first time. So you've introduced a gain factor into the spatial translation by taking your temporal bandpass filtering and applying a gain factor to that. So this is all kind of 1970s computer vision uh, motion analysis that I'm running through here. But that explains, this local linearization explains why you get the motion from temporal processing at, a sing at, at static positions. We okay with that? Um, and then you can also see where it's going to break down by the same uh, simple analysis. So let's look at a sinusoid and see where this, this little approximation is going to start to fail. Um, so here's, uh, now our signal F has become a, a cosine wave. And it's got some spatial frequency. And plus, there's this offset we're applying to it. We're moving a little bit. Now, in this linearization approximation, we're 
uh, approximating that sum as the original uh, signal times a little factor times the spatial derivative. And what we want is for that, uh, this is like the bandpass filtering output, we want that to equal the true translation of the cosine. And by the addition law for cosines, we know what that true translation is. It's this, cosine A, cosine B, minus sine A, sine B. And so when are these two going to be equal? Well, when it's when that uh, amplified translation is fairly small, so that the cosine of the amplification factor times the translation is about 1, and the sine of the, that argument is about that argument. And well, what's a ballpark for when it's too small, or when it's, when it's no longer small enough? Uh, let's say we want 10% accuracy of this approximation. So uh, sine of pi over 4 is 0.9 of pi over 4. So, uh, so let's say we can't do this for arguments larger than pi over 4. So that tells us a limit on how much we can crank up the gain and expect this approximation to work as a function of the spatial frequency omega. So for, um, for very long wavelength sinusoids, we can really crank this up and still have our approximation hold. For very fine details, we can't crank it up too much. Um, so here's just uh, some figures showing that to be the case. Um, Here's a, a low spatial frequency sinusoid, cosinusoid, and here are various true translations of it. Here's our, under this linearization approximation, here's our version of the translated versions of it. So we take a small translation and look, that as, look at that as our frame two and add back amplified amounts of the difference. And these are what we get as our approximate motion magnified versions of the sinusoid. If we take a higher frequency one and do the same processing, it really starts to break down earlier. So now we can see how it breaks down. And, where we, sh where we can do it and where we shouldn't do it. So let's make a little processing stream. And this is, again, you know, real simple, e really easy to make real time, um, where we take an image and we'll break it down according to spatial frequency components. The places where the spatial frequencies are low enough that we can get away with this approximation, let's go do it. And then places where the spatial frequencies are too high, let's, let's lay off and not, not amplify things as much. Uh, so you might have a, a sort of amplification factor as a function of spatial frequency where above that limit we're going to go for it and then below that limit we'll fail down to zero amplification. So let's see how this works. Uh, here's an ideal input signal for this thing which is a very smooth thing. Here's the source and you can barely tell if you can at all that it's moving. Uh, but on the right is the motion magnified version of that simply by sitting at each position, bandpass filtering at that one position, and adding back that signal into the uh, video stream and re-rendering it. And now you can have fun with this. You can take uh, an input on the left where these things are wiggling at different frequencies, and you can uh, pull out what components of the video you want to amplify based on your temporal filtering. So if we have a, uh, a low frequency temporal filter, we'll only pick out this guy's motions and amplify them. The other ones, their motions aren't really changed. We can uh, tune the filter to, to amplify the motions of different ones of these. And the other ones, their motions aren't, aren't significantly changed. Um, so here's a subway. I don't want the red line. Got my camera there. Jumps all around. And then here's the motion magnified version of that on the right. And so we take the whole image, put it in this pyramid, do the processing, and re-render. Um, so we also have a, the real-time demo just to, uh, to add stress to my life and hopefully interest to yours. Let me do this right now. Um, let's see. Let's resume. How about? So it's, it's, a, it's a Windows demo, so I have to make my MacBook Air look like a Windows machine. Um, Okay. Okay, so here I am. Uh, I'm not moving yet. Let me retry. Okay. So um, let me, uh, what should I do? Let's do this. And let's crank it up. So the bottom top line is the amplitude. The bottom controls the filter parameters. Let me try to stay as still as I can. 
The right side is me being still. The left side is me. You see, it's like a ventriloquist detector. <laughs> uh, so you can see me breathing. Also, you get this annoying feedback from this camera looking at the out camera's output on the screen. Anyway, um, so this is our real-time motion magnifier output. What I really want to do is make an Android version of it, where you take it around the world, and you've got to do extra steps. You want, you'd, you'd want to stabilize it so that it ignored uh, camera motions, but we know what those look like, and only amplified things that you were looking at, so you get this kind of magic window on the world. OK, enough of that. Let me go back. Great. Um, OK, and, and then you have, you have choice about what you use for your temporal filters. If you want to just pick out the heart rate and you know more or less where it is, you'd want to have a ni nice narrow band one. Um, as I mentioned, you can pick out various things you want amplified. So here's what, how might you use this thing in the real world? Well, oftentimes parents of perfectly healthy newborn babies wonder, is the baby breathing? And so we can uh, show in the process output on the right that the baby is breathing. We can see it much more easily. Um, here's uh, one. Uh, the, on the left, you see just an ordinary hand. On the right, you see the motion magnified version of it. And you can see the pulse on the uh, artery there. Um, and here's where we uh, can tune to, to and amplify the motion of selected items. So here's a guitar, and the top two strings are both vibrating very, very slightly. You can't see the motion at all on the top video. That's the input. But on the bottom two videos, you can see the motion magnified versions. Uh, the middle one, we selected the frequency of the top string to amplify. So it amplifies anything moving at that frequency, which is that string. And uh, the bottom one is the, the second string. These are, this is a high-speed video, so, you slow down, so it slows down the motion enough to see those oscillations. Have you tried picking up the harmonics? Uh, right. I, I'll show you something related to that on a drum head in a second. Um, if you take an SLR and have it go in burst mode, the mirror flips up and down and uh, it moves. And so here on the right is the motion magnified version of the thing on the left where I can't see any motion in it. And again, these are both high speed, uh, 300 frames per second videos. Um, and then, you know, just to make sure we weren't fooling ourselves and make you sure that we're not fooling you, um, we did it again with a, a laser pointer strapped onto the mirror going to a to the lens, going to a mirror down here, going back up to this piece of paper here. So that big moment arm lets us do the motion magnification optically, if you will. So um, you can see from that red dot moves a little bit, and it moves at the same time and in the same way as the motion magnified camera is moving. So we think we're looking at the right stuff when we see this motion magnified output. And again, on the input video, I can't see the camera moving at all. Um, okay, so uh, the, the slide title says Motion Magnification Revisited. I just want to, just for completeness, I guess, mention this earlier version that we had done. So, so this current version is real simple, like kind of brain dead simple, actually. You just sit at one position. Well, you, you break it up into spatial bands, perhaps. But then you just sit at one position, do your temporal filtering, add it back in. Uh, what could be simpler? Um, uh, about five or six years ago, we also did this motion magnification approach, but in a much more complicated way. So there we uh, tra identified feature points. We tracked the feature points in a way that made them robust to occlusion edges, which was really hard. And then we filled in uh, textures uh, to um, fill in places where the motion had moved beyond where we detected things and made this final output. And so this worked well and got some attention. But uh, really, it needed, I have to say, it needed Sal Leo, the graduate student there, to really make it work because he's, he's, a, he's a master at making things work. And it's, it's very hard for any other one else to get it to work. But it did work nicely. Here's, here's the old version of motion magnification showing my wife uh, on, on the swing in the backyard. And you can see the deformation of the beam, uh, which you can just barely see in the input video, not really. 
Um, but again, this was done in this uh, much more complicated way. And it just as a as sort of an A-B comparison, here's this uh, camera video I had just shown you, done that second way on the far right, although done without SUS, uh, so it's not as masterfully implemented as it had been before, but using optical flow and amplifying the optical flow and re-rendering, uh, we get the images on the right, which are not as quite as clean as the ones in the middle. Um, I should say, so that was, let's see, that was the status as of about uh, three months ago. And then just before the camera ready copy for the SIGGRAPH conference was due, we had this insight on how to do it so much better than before. And so we now we have this new version. I mean, we didn't have time to, you know, it was, it was a significant change. We didn't have time to change the paper around. So we submitted, you know, we let that go through, and now we submitted a new thing to SIGGRAPH Asia, you know, overcoming all the shortcomings of those idiots who wrote that previous paper, and now here's our new paper. Um, so, and I, I can't really, uh, to be honest, we're applying for a patent on this new method, and I, I can't really tell you the details, but I just love the output so much, I want to show you uh, the new method and how it's better than the old one. So here's, the bottom left is the one I've just shown you, and then the bottom right is our new method, which we like much more. Uh, it's, it's, it's different processing, it's related, but not, not exactly the same. So, so now you can see with the new one, we're much less, uh, ampli we amplify the noise much less, and we can push the, the exaggeration much further. Uh, and, and again, the, guitar, the old guitar sequence, the new guitar sequence. And then we also made some new sequences, which I really love, I want to show you. Uh, so here's, again, this is with a new method, but it's the same idea. So here's our little setup. We have a, a speaker, um, and a drum head that the speaker is moving very slightly. You can't really see it moving. Uh, but so let's amplify it. So uh, there's the input on the left, and processing that input, we make the sequence on the right. Sorry. And then, okay. And then now we want to get we can get down tr ground truth because we can uh, crank up the amp the speaker amplitude to. Uh, actually physically magnify the motion by a factor of 10, although there's certainly non-linear non responses, so it's not going to exactly be right. So we have the low amplitude input here. We have turned up the sound on the speaker by a factor of 10 to give you uh, true motion magnification here. And then here we've processed this video to amplify it by a factor of 10 in the middle. And so if, if, if the world were, were perfectly linear and our algorithm were perfectly accurate, these two would look the same. Neither is exactly true, but let's see how they look. All uh, right. Um, I guess I'll play it. So they're, they're, they're commensurate, let's say. And then uh, you can also, um, we put in a mixture of two wavelengths there, and now we're selecting which mode to magnify. And now this one I love. This is, all, this is why I want to show you this. Um, this is, uh, again, uh, Michael Rubenstein's brainchild to do this. Uh, the eye makes micro saccades. Um, they're actually, I'm told, essential for seeing. If you take them away, then the image doesn't move slightly over the retina, and you can't see anything. But so we took high-speed video of his eye showing these micro saccades, which I, I can't really see at all from the input video. And we ran this through our new motion magnification method. And so the output is on the right. So let me just show you that. So you can see that you know the eye is this massive jelly moving underwater. And, and that's all processed from the, the sequence on the right, which uh, let me show that again, because I like it. So here it is again. And again, the right was derived from the image on the left. So we're, we're actually hopeful that, you know, so this does indeed give you a microscope on the world of small motions. And um, I'm really excited about exploring other applications with this. I, I want to, you know, I'm hoping that this can shine, shine a light, as it were, on, on, on the world of small motions the same way that strobe photography shines a light on the world of small times. Um, I'd love to take pictures of skyscrapers on a windy day and see them, if they do, you know, blowing like uh, bamboo in the wind and so forth. Um, so, so I've shown you these two things. Uh, again, they're, 
there are two different ways of looking at the world differently. Analyzing things, re-rendering it, coming up, coming up with a new video. One was this motion denoising for separating mo a video into its two components, long-term and short-term. And then the second one uh, is this motion magnification of taking uh, a video input, which may have very small motions not detectable by eye, and amplifying them and, and visualizing them and using it like a, like a microscope for motion. Thank you. Yes. Right. 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 So, uh, so yeah. So, if you were to put this on Android or iPad application, you don't want to confound the motions in the world. You want to try to amplify from the ones caused by camera motion. And there are indeed two different ways you might try to remove those handheld camera motions. One is if you, if people moved at a particular frequency. I, I'm I haven't studied it, but I would be surprised if they did. The thing that I'm hoping to capitalize on is that, uh, is that the, the change in the image over the whole image would be a homography. And, and uh, you'd have to do an additional step that's not done with this work of identifying that homography and stabilizing that, and then take that stabilized input, stabilized against camera motions, and now process that for the residual motions, which would we would hope correspond to the things of interest going on in the world. Yes? Um, so would it be simpler to uh, use the inertial sensing devices already in the iPad? I, uh, well, we haven't tried it. I would doubt that it would be accurate enough to uh, remove all the residual image motions. I mean, there's a big moment arm there between any small motion and changes in the pixels. And we can, we're going to be amplifying changes that are definitely sub-pixel in uh, amount. So I, I'd be very surprised if you could actually accurately remove all those from the inertial measurements. But we haven't tried. So how about does the new method work for the stream um, Let's see. Um, we tried, let's see, there's two new methods. There's the one that's in SIGGRAPH this summer and then the one that is in submission. Uh, we tried the, the one that will appear this summer on the swing set sequence, and it didn't work nearly as well as the old version did on this week because we're really amplifying that motion quite a bit. Um, the new method's going to work better, but it's still, uh, it's not going to be able to move the thing, uh, you know, 40 pixels and fill in the stuff behind the way that this one does. So let's see. So in other words, you have a temporal bandpass, and you amplify the motion of something, say the guitar string or something. Yeah. And now you take that in measured motion and do what with it? You can apply it to the um, finite frequencies as well. To the finite? To the finite frequencies. Oh, I see. In other words, we have trouble moving very fine spatial frequencies. Without so without yeah, uh, yeah, you could do that. That's true. Yeah. Yes? Uh, the answer may be implicit in the way you're doing it, but there, I can see uses in studying the world with what you've shown us here um, that are, you can think of them as visualization. Uh, I, I want to look at phenomena and use my cognitive process. And then there, there are other uses that you can think of as much more quantitative. Right. Um, 
let's see. So with the old motion magnification approach, we had to explicitly measure, measure the motion translation vectors. So there, there you actually had the, the data right there. So from the optical flow, right. Pretty right. From the right. So with this new method, um, we don't have, you know, we have these, uh, you know, uh, temporal filtering measurements made at, at single locations. Um, so I think to really uh, understand spatial displacements, um, you would need to go follow this up with a post-processing step, which looked at optical flow. Yeah. And um, I, I think that would be a reasonable thing to do. You'd have to, I, I would think you'd want to sort of step through the noise analysis and make sure, um, uh, check whether you really had any benefit as far as noise sensitivity by first doing this visualization stage, then doing measurement, as opposed to doing measurement right from the start. So I, um, I'm not sure there'd be a benefit to doing it in a two-stage approach. I, I don't know. Anyway, thanks a lot.